All right. Hello, everyone. Happy Webinar Wednesday. Um, thank you for giving us a second and your patience. We were having some technical difficulties behind the scenes, uh, but I think that we're good to go. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to everyone who has already jumped in and started the conversation. Always love to see that happen. Um, so very excited to have you with us today. And I've got someone with me. So uh, maybe you've noticed Julie Broad is joining me today and she is the founder of Book Launchers, but she's also so much more. So not only that, but she's founder of self-publishing services, Book Launchers. I just said that, I read it again. Also an <laughs> Amazon over one, uh, overall number one best-selling author. Um, she has written several books. One of my favorites is The New Brand You, which I just love that play on words. And her latest book is Self-Publish and Succeed. Julie is an expert on writing books with marketing in mind and teaches authors how to write no boring books on her popular YouTube channel. Her YouTube channel is great, bookauntures.tv. Check it out if you have not. Um, and her advice for authors and investors has been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur.com, Yahoo Business, CTV, The Toronto Sun, and Medium.com. Let's applaud for Julie, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. And before I turn it over, uh, please, for you guys that are tuning in, drop your questions in the chat as they come up. Julie will answer them at the end of uh, the conversation we have today. And um, all of this recording or all of this webinar will be recorded and we will send it to everyone who registered. So if you have to hop in, uh, hop in late, hop out early, we got you covered. All right, Julie, are you ready? You ready to do this thing? I am I ready. ready. All right, so I am going to go ahead and play your presentation. All right, let's see if we can get this to work. So the exciting times that we're living in today, we have all this technology and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. All right, so can we see turning a no into a yes? We can see it, yes, yay. <laughs> Okay, sweet. <laughs> well, I'll dive in while you try and figure out why it won't play. We might have to go screen by right. screen because we right. have the same problem. This is the same problem we had before we came on. So that's okay. You can see, you can see just no peeking ahead. Okay, you guys don't, don't cheat and look ahead. <laughs> yes. um, okay, so I'm going to start with the story. So once upon a time, there was a little girl who dreamed of being a writer. And she wrote short stories and she was even published in newspapers. She won a, an essay contest writing about an inventor named Alexander Graham Bell. But as the little girl grew up and went into high school English and started to get bad grades because her English teacher said she couldn't write. And then people started to say, oh, teachers, oh, writers, they don't make money. And the little girl thought, you know, I love money, you know, money's good. So she went off to business school instead <laughs> of pursuing her dream of being a writer. Now, of course, the little girl was me and business school inadvertently actually got me back to writing, but it wasn't a straight journey. And a lot of things that happened along the way involved no's that actually were yeses, or I was able to turn them into yeses. And that's what we're talking about today. But the whole journey started with a single book. And I always love to share this story because I want to remind everybody that your book can have a powerful impact on other people's lives. And for me, a single book changed my entire life. And it was, you know, as I had started my job after my my bachelor is in business, uh, one of my coworkers said, you have to read this book. And I read the book and it got me thinking completely differently. And I'm sure that many of you have read this book. I know all of you have heard of this book. It was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I suddenly thought I have to get my money working for me because I don't want to spend the rest of my life working hard for my money. So you can go to the next slide, Chelsea. You can put that next picture up on the screen. Thanks. Um, and, and so as I was thinking of this, I decided that I would start investing in real estate. And this was 2001. And I took money that I had been saving for my MBA. And I instead put it into my first two rental properties. And from that, that day forward, I was a real estate investor. And I started buying uh, properties. I bought a property every year. Some years I bought several. And I started partnering with my, my, at the time it was my boyfriend, eventually became my husband. And we just kept buying real estate. And by 2008, which, you know, the, the year was very bad timing. But by 2008, I decided I was tired of working for somebody else. And I was going to go full time as a real estate investor. And uh, I also decided to start writing a newsletter for friends and family, because in that seven years, I had learned a lot. And so it kind of brought me back to writing. I just started sharing my experiences as an investor. 
And then I also decided to start a training and education company to help other investors. So I got into teaching and I was now teaching and writing and making money doing it. And little by little, I started to build a platform. Now, if you're not familiar with what a platform is, really it's anything that puts you in front of an audience. It can be social media, it can be email newsletters, speaking, you know, there's lots of things that make up a platform. But as my platform grew, I started to get connected with different people. And I had a few friends that connected me with two different publishers because they were working on books with, with these publishers. And so I started to have this conversation and all of a sudden that little girl who dreamed of being a writer had a potential book deal offer. And I just, I could not believe it. Like all of those hopes and dreams that I had as a little girl were there again and I was so excited. And I got, the conversation got very serious with Wiley uh, I had a book idea and Wiley said, no, um, you know, we've already done a general real estate. We've done general real estate investing books, which they felt that book idea was. They said, but you know what? We're interested in working with you. And we had this idea. So they shared this idea with me and said, you go write this book. And so we went back and forth for three months building a proposal. And at no time did it even cross my mind that I wasn't getting a book deal because they in essence, had given me this idea and I hadn't pursued them. They, we'd been connected. And so it just felt like the book deal was the next thing that was gonna happen. The email I got though, um, if you wanna click to the next slide, Chelsea, thank you. Uh, the email I got from them was this one. Julie, the marketing department has reviewed your proposal and doesn't feel you have a strong enough platform to sell books. So first they told me, no, your book idea is not going to sell. And now after three months, they were telling me that I wasn't going to be able to sell books. So remember, little girl, really excited, had dreams now of this being her first book of many. I was now absolutely devastated. I'm not too proud to tell you I spent a lot of hours crying after this because I thought that all my dreams were crushed and ruined. And, and at the time I was living in Canada and there really weren't very many publishing options. Um, Wiley was really the only one, there was two kind of publishers and I'd already had a conversation with the other, wasn't a good fit. So Wiley was the only real option for me as a Canadian. Uh, and now they had said no. So I was absolutely crushed and devastated by this. It took about six months before I kind of recovered or healed enough to, to look at things differently. And I decided that, you know what, that first book idea I had, I, I had to write it. There was just, you know, that thing, that feeling, I'm sure many of you felt it, like I had to write that book. And I also knew deeply that it would help others, kind of like Rich Dad Poor Dad helped me, not on the same scale, but I, I believe deeply that there were other investors out there that really needed to have the message that I was going to share around real estate. So I decided to self-publish. But I also was pretty hurt and and really upset about this whole thing. So I kind of went into it with a little bit of a vengeance in that I decided if I was going to self-publish, I would do it better than if Wiley had given me a book deal. So not only did I spend hundreds and hundreds of hours writing this book, but I dove deep into self-publishing and publishing. This was 2012, so there wasn't that much information on self-publishing yet, but I read it. I read and consumed everything there was and studied publishing. I spent more hours learning about publishing than I did even writing the book so that I could produce a book that was as good or better. The other piece of this is that I also had no ego in the game. I wrote the book that needed to be written and I told stories that I was really quite certain would ruin my reputation in many ways with my education and training clients and also with our investors because by this time you know we've been raising capital to do real estate deals and I was going to share some of the big mistakes that we'd never told anybody we'd made because I knew they needed to be shared. So the real gift in that is is by not believing that my book was going to really matter, I wrote the book that really needed to be written. And, and ultimately, also because of that, I think, because I wrote a book with zero, zero goal for myself, really. It was, I was writing it for helping other people. A lot of people rallied behind me. And this book that Wiley told me wouldn't sell by the author they told me couldn't sell enough books, it went to number one on Amazon. So you can see that on the next screen. So there it is, top of Amazon in print books. So a lot of people say they're an Amazon bestseller. That's number one in a category. I was number one in print books. <laughs> and I sold thousands and thousands of copies. I had a lot of supporters that shared it with their audiences. 
And it was in the top 100 books on Amazon in Canada for 45 days. And, you know, this was, I mean, this was a tremendous accomplishment that I'm very proud of, but ultimately Wiley saying no to me was one of the greatest gifts that ever could have happened. And so the next screen kind of highlights four of the reasons why I think it was the greatest thing that could have happened. First was the money. I mean, straight up, traditional publishers are gonna pay you way, way less than you're going to make when you sell the book on your own. And calculating it without even considering books that I sold at live events, um, so just straight from Amazon and, and kind of the platforms that I was published on, I made eight times more money on the books sold. So just to give you a sense of what that means, in that first year, I would have made less than $10,000 from the book deal from Wiley and I made almost $80,000 um, for myself in that first year, just to give you a sense of how much money that was. And I owned the rights, which I didn't appreciate how important that was until a friend of mine who did get a book deal with Wiley ended up having his book, uh, he was in the real estate space, he wrote a book about investing in US real estate as a Canadian. And a couple of years later, he became a life coach and stopped promoting real estate. And so Wiley republished his book word for word under somebody else's name. These were all his stories. He had two co-authors on the book. Those co-authors got no credit. They were their stories too. And when I found this out, I was stunned. And my friend said, well, look, it's, it's morally gross, but it's legally right. They owned every word. All of the content that goes into a book when you traditionally publish is owned by them. And so to me, it was a great gift because I owned all my rights. I eventually licensed off courses that I had built based on that book. And a lot of those things can be limited by your book deal that you get with a traditional deal. It also, and this is one of the greatest gifts that opened me up to self-publishing. Before this, I thought I had to be chosen. I really thought you had to have a book deal to be a real writer, a real author. Um, and I realize now that the only gatekeeper is really holding me back is the one in my head. And self-publishing is a tremendous option. In fact, I think it's the best option for the vast majority of authors for so many reasons. But ultimately, it led me to create book launchers, which for me, I think is like the winding journey of that little girl who wanted to be a writer and a teacher. I now spend every day surrounded by authors. I teach those authors everything that we learn at book launchers. And, uh, and I also write books. <laughs> so I ended up getting to where I always wanted to be and surrounded, you know, building this phenomenal company full of great people getting to do cool things like talk to all of you. So uh, it was the greatest gift. So um, I'm going to give you a quick quote. And I'm going to share three ways that I turn no's into yeses. Because as authors, my friends, you're going to hear no all the time or you're gonna get ignored. <laughs> That's kind of the same as no in my mind. If somebody doesn't answer you, it's kind of the same as no. And so the best thing to do is to look at every single no as an opportunity. So we're gonna go through that. So if you wanna put up the quote, which is the next slide, that would be great, thanks. So this is one of my favorites. And I, I always look at the opportunity in everything. And this quote kind of grounds me in that mindset. So I thought I would share it with you. Every time I thought I was be being rejected from something good, I was actually being redirected to something better. I love that. And if every time I look at where I thought something was a devastating no and where I ended up later, I'm always so glad. So again, Wiley saying no to me was one of the greatest gifts I've ever been given. So this quote I think is great. All right, next slide. So this graphic is really cool if you look at it. It's a yes full of no's. And so in my mind, whenever I hear a no, it's really like, okay, how is this going to become a yes? And so that's why I think this graphic is so cool. I couldn't believe I found this. Um, but you're going to hear no all the time. And I just made a short list of places you're going to hear no. Um, endorsements, you'll apply your book for awards, media podcast interviews, publishing options, reviewers, speaking engagements, bookstores. I mean, even when you apply to work with a company like Book Launchers, we're a professional self-publishing services company, but we'll still edit your keep all rights and royalties. Like this is your book, but we still have to turn people away because we only want to work with people that were a best fit to help you succeed. So even we have to say no sometimes. Now we try to do it in a way that gives you somewhere to go, like we <laughs> give you direction, but still there's no's. There's always no's on your journey to success. And so you just have to get ready and embrace them and look at it like every time you get a no, you're just building your way to that bigger yes that's going to take you somewhere that's even cooler than where you thought you wanted to go. Um, all right, so the three ways I do this, that's on the next screen. 
so this is my son Jackson and he's <laughs> I thought I would put him up there because he is a master negotiator he just turned four and uh, he could walk before he could talk so he's like one of those <laughs> his communication skills are off the charts and he is brilliant at turning every no into a yes <laughs> and his first approach is is it really a no? Like he's going to dig into that no and understand every obstacle that is is standing between that no and that yes. <laughs> so you got to channel your inner four-year-old, uh, your inner negotiator, because there's always an opportunity in that no. And often you have to understand the reasons for that no, because it's in understanding the no that can create that opportunity. And I'll give you some examples um, in a minute of, of kind of three different case studies of authors that have done this and how it turned out. Uh, and then it's asking yourself, are there other ways to achieve that same objective? And what's the opportunity or gift in the no? So we'll break those down uh, going forward here. So the first one, if you wanna go to the next slide, please. So, um, and you weren't supposed to be able to see all the pictures. I had animations for you, so you get the reveal before. But uh, so this is Michael Brenner, and Michael Brenner came to us with a manuscript called The Empathy Formula. The Empathy Formula was a book about really how how having empathy leads to better business. But the problem was he'd had some people read the book in advance and they said, no, like just, you know, been this thing, like there's no hope, nobody cares about empathy, you know, the book isn't gonna sell. And Michael brought it to us and in working, we have somebody on our team called a story expert. And in working with a story expert, you know, he, he was talking about how, I think Michael's had 52 different jobs in his life. And he was just saying, you know, a lot of people think they have to be mean to get things done and to get people to do things. He said, and, and you know, mean people just suck. And it was kind of like a light bulb moment for the two of them. And we realized, or they realized that, you know, that was the book, that this book wasn't really, it's about empathy and the empathy formula is still alive and well in the Mean People Suck book, but Mean People Suck was really the message and it's marketable people. When we put this up at conferences, people always gravitate to this and everybody, nobody's gonna argue with that. Nobody's gonna say, no, no, mean people are great. <laughs> Nobody says that. So people instantly agree, instantly relate. But if you see the subtitle, it's how empathy leads to bigger profits and a better life. So we were able to find that hook and create a book that he was able to brand himself around. And he does speaking and lots of other things around his business. He was now able to leverage this book to, to further build his brand. And you can see um, he even wears it when he goes on news TV. And in this case, I always show this picture because it's like she was prepped in advance to, to match. <laughs> Because she wore a green, this interviewer, she wore a green, a green dress that day too. But you're, nobody, whenever somebody says your book isn't good enough, look at that and try to see what part isn't good enough and what can you make better. Um, you know, and I always, I always challenge you with that or not challenge you, but caution you that be careful when somebody's telling you your book isn't good enough to understand where they're coming from because a lot of people will say that without actually having the expertise to ground where that's coming from. Because he had friends that told him this book wasn't good enough. But when we read it, we saw the potential and we didn't have, you know, in working with him, we didn't change a lot of this book. We really just wrapped it up in a concept in order to make it marketable. So your book may not be quite good enough, but what can you do that's just gonna, you know, a little change can often make a huge, huge difference in your book. All right, uh, next slide. Okay, so this is Gotham Bade. He came to us uh, with uh, the joys of compounding, all drafted and ready to go through the whole editing process. He had been trying to get a book deal and he had a very specific goal in mind. He wanted to have it through a university publishing house. He had some other specific you know, goals that it were his, so I won't share them, but he wasn't getting anywhere. So he brought his book to us and he said, you know, I'm going to publish this book on my own and show them that I can sell a lot of books. And so uh, the first version on the left was the version that we worked on. And, you know, together we created this book and he did sell a lot of copies to the point where Columbia University ended up giving him a publishing deal. And then it's now actually with Harper Collins. So I'm not sure what happened, <laughs> but it went from one publishing house to another. And so now he's achieved all his goals and then some with this book. So it was just another way to get there. Um, I'm getting some weird feedback. I don't know if it's on your side or mine. Are there people hearing that? Everything sounds good to me, but let okay. us know in the chat if you are hearing anything weird. 
Okay, cool. Um, if it's not me, then I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I don't want everybody to not be able to hear. So, so yeah, so are there other ways to achieve your objective? So in Gotham's case, it was self-publishing and proving to the publishing houses that he could sell a lot of books and then getting the deals that he actually wanted out of it. So there's always another way. Um, and I think for a lot of us, self-publishing is actually the gateway to where we wanna go with our books, but not always, there's other, there's other routes. But I wanted to share his story because I thought it was so cool because he actually went to the publishing house that he wanted. And now I'm not sure I have to call him and find out why he's with HarperCollins now, but it's gone to many, many places. So it's very cool. Um, all right, so next slide. So this was another really interesting uh, story. So I had the one story where my one friend, his book got republished completely under somebody else's name. This was another friend who uh, had a production company that works with HGTV. They wanted to take this book and turn it into a TV series for HGTV. Um, but Wiley owned the rights to this book and Wiley wouldn't negotiate with, with that production company. They said no. But my friend really wanted to pursue this TV opportunity. And so he had to buy his book back from Wiley. And uh, I don't know how much it cost, but I do know he had to buy uh, back every copy of his book that was in circulation. And so with being with Wiley, it was in every bookstore with multiple copies. So you can just imagine how much that was to buy back every copy at retail, by the way, um, <laughs> uh, for, of your book. So uh, he, and then he had a whole garage full of, <laughs> of books. <laughs> But for him, oh, and then the, the, the sad part sort of of this story is that they he flew to Florida, they filmed the pilot, and then HGTV didn't end up greenlighting this series. But for him, he doesn't regret it at all because he owns this book now. And so he was able to pursue that HGTV show and still that was a great experience. Like he, he still gets excited just talking about you know, going down there and spending weeks shooting this pilot and even imagining what it could be. But then he took his concept and turned it into a, a training program that he taught across country. Um, he created partnerships he couldn't have created with because Wiley would have held him back in terms of the rights that he owned to this concept. And then he republished this book on his own and he gives it away constantly, which is something that's very hard to do when you're a traditionally published author because you're, you have to buy copies from the publisher and they don't give you a very good discount. So it's very expensive to just give your book away and they won't let you give away the ebook in a lot of cases. So you can't just give PDF copies away. You have to have permission to do that because you don't own it. So he was able to give it away and do a lot of great things for a lot of causes with his book that he couldn't do. And ultimately he's done a lot of reinvention as a result of this no. So it's a really, really cool story of the gift that was in that no of we won't we won't negotiate and how he ended up getting the rights back to his book and was able to evolve as a result all right next next slide please so ultimately uh, and we have lots of time for questions by the way there's only so many ways i can tell you to reframe a no <laughs> But I wanted to share this one last story with you because so in the pursuit of trying to find people to endorse and support and help promote my first book more than cash flow that we talked about at the beginning. There was this one speaker that I had seen speak at this this conference that I had gone to in Las Vegas and her name was Deb Cole. And I knew she was going to be speaking at a conference that I was going to be at next and I really just wanted to meet her and also potentially ask about how like some of her connections that might help promote my book. And so I reached out and I asked her to go for lunch. And this was terrifying for me as I'm sure it is for many of you because the fear of rejection is, is really high. And I was scared of just having her say, no, I won't go for lunch with you. Uh, but I did it, you know, it was just one of those things where I was like, you know what, like the worst thing that's going to happen is, is she says no and you know, life goes on. So, so I reached out and I kind of said, we're gonna be at the same event. And I, you know, I, I loved what you said at your last talk. And I gave a couple examples to show that I'd paid attention. And then I said, can I buy you lunch? And she said, yes. And so that picture that you see on the left um, where she's in the blue dress and I've got the blue shirt on, that was that lunch. So we went for lunch and we hit it off. She didn't end up doing anything to support my book. Um, there just wasn't a good fit her. She was pivoting in what she was doing at the time. And um, so she, she very kindly said no, 
But the cool part of this is that no has turned into a phenomenal friendship. And I've been, that was in that red dress and the blue dress down there, I was kind of her plus one for a huge event that she put on in Las Vegas um, for NMX, if anybody knows the, the New Media Awards. So she put on this big event and so I got to be behind the scenes and on the red carpet and doing all these fun things with her. She came to Canada to speak at one of my events and we've now had almost a decade long friendship as a result. And it all started with me reaching out and being afraid of a no and ultimately getting a no, <laughs> but again, getting an even better gift in return. And my son now looks at her as an aunt and adores her to pieces. So embrace those no's because ultimately, even when you get a no, sometimes there's an even better gift. Like I'd way rather have her as a friend than have had her endorse and promote my book. <laughs> So it's very cool. And I wanted to share that as inspiration so that you will reach outside your comfort zone because I, for every, like this story, I probably have a hundred people, who, by the way, I've forgotten about that I've asked and they've either ignored me or said, no, there's probably a thousand uh, because you will forget, like it might sting for a bit, but you'll forget. And then you'll have great stories like this that you can focus on because of the one person who does say yes and that you build new friendships and relationships. So um, next slide, please. So another quote, because I think it's really important uh, to have things, um, I like to have quotes to kind of ground my, my mind and things when things happen. And so 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than the ones that you did do. And so throw off those bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream and discover. And for me, the one thing I can tell you with certainty is that I won't be disappointed. I've gone in some crazy directions and we're about to just make another move um, into a brand new city. And, you know, I just looked at it and like, well, if it doesn't work out, we'll learn something, we'll gain something and we'll, we'll go on to something else, but I won't ever look back disappointed. And so I hope that you will be able to say the same thing. Um, last slide, I think. So, uh, again, I have lots of time for questions, but ultimately, uh, you know, I'm, I'd be, I'd love to connect with you, especially if you're writing nonfiction. Book Launchers only works with nonfiction, and all of my material surrounds nonfiction. Um, I have lots of fiction writers and authors that follow on BookLaunchers.tv and YouTube, so it's a really great, fun community. If you haven't checked out the videos, we have new content every Tuesday and Friday. And if you do want to reach out to me for support or help, BookLaunchers.com. Basically, anything that gets you an email address gets to me. So. Signing up for the newsletter, filling out the contact form, ultimately it all gets back to me somehow so you can connect with me that, that way. Um, yeah, thanks Chelsea. What questions do we have? All right, I am going to close out of the PowerPoint and let's see. All right, so thank you everybody for joining us and Julie, thanks for rolling with the punches there. That's just so the essence of turning a no into yes when our computers were like, no, we're not gonna share this PowerPoint. And we're like, yes, we are. And we're gonna have a wonderful presentation <laughs> conversation around it. So um, let's see, so anyone who has questions, just go ahead and drop them in the chat and we will get to them. Um, I am just looking through and seeing what you guys want to know. Uh, let's see, what is your opinion? So Roland is asking, what is your opinion in developing an author page for your Facebook account? So a little bit on the marketing side there. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, Facebook is one of those things, if you don't already have it going on, I would dive into understanding your objectives for doing it and what you think it's going to achieve. So in lieu of a website, if you think you're gonna do that instead of a website, then you could do that. Um, if you think you're gonna build it now to sell a lot of books and your book's coming out in three months, I would say that you're it's too late because <laughs> it's going to take a while to build that. So I, it always looks at, you know, what are your resources and what's going to accomplish your objective in what I kind of look at as minimum, minimal effective dose. So don't spread yourself across all the platforms, focus on one that you're going to spend time on. And ultimately, if you're three months out from launch, you, you, you do need some sort of a web presence. So if you don't have that, a Facebook author page is a quick way to do it. Otherwise, I'd say build a website and then spend your time connecting with people who already have your reader in their audience, because that's what's gonna actually help you sell books. Yeah, I love that, thank you. And so we've got a question about accessing your services, but you didn't talk too much about book launchers. This is really about your story, but can you just give us a kind of overview of book launchers? And also I'll, I'll just plug the Lulu Partners page, book launchers is featured there, another way to find it. Um, but yeah, just tell, tell us a little bit about what you guys are offering, Julie. 
Yeah, for sure. So we're a professional self-publishing services company, but we're full service. So we don't just do editing. Like some people write us and say, quote me on editing. And we don't do that because we're marketing focused. So we're going to talk to you about how we'll help you sell your book because I have a team that will pitch you for live appearances, podcasts, you know, library distribution, bookstore distribution, on and on. So we're really trying to help you find readers at the end. And in order to succeed doing that, we're going to work with you right from the beginning to figure out those things that have to be in place place in your book in order to help it sell. And just to give you a couple examples, I mean, the table of contents is for nonfiction is one thing that people don't spend enough time on. And yet it will get you speaking gigs, it will get you media appearances. It's one of the first things people look at if they if they like your cover and your title, they click that look inside on Amazon, and they go there if they're holding your book in their hand, they flip to the table of contents. And if they don't see things that grab their curiosity or make them want to read it, you've lost that opportunity. So those are some of the things we want to build early, early into the process. So we can't be one off because we're built, we're baking marketing into this whole thing in order to set your book up for success from the beginning. So we're actually a membership based service, which is kind of a weird, a weird thing because people are expect a fixed price, but it gives you complete flexibility. We're able to build it in. You can come to us with a finished draft. You can come to us with an idea. You know, we have more flexibility that way. And then it also allows us to add in all these services that you might need along the way to set you up for success. Yeah, I think it's so important to just be thinking from the beginning about your marketing plan and like you said, how to bake that in. So it's great to see you guys are so intentional about that. And I think uh, one of the other questions was, can you kind of give an estimate of what the cost will be? But it sounds like it's very, very catered to each project. So um, could you speak to that at all? Or is that really, a you know, have a conversation offline or maybe follow up with you to get that information? Yeah, it's all on our website. So that's the other thing. When I started this company, I wanted to be super transparent which is also why I love Lulu, why we work with you, because you guys are really transparent, you're educating, you're trying to add value and help people too. Um, but yeah, so all the pricing's on our website, but typically most people are gonna work with us for somewhere to six to 18 months, because again, we're working on marketing at the end. So, and it, we have two levels of service. So typically you're gonna come to us and spend, you know, 7,500 to $30,000. Um, we have some people who have been with us for years and we're working on their second book. Um, we have one that's on their third book. So, you know, some of our clients just work with us for a long, long time. They write the first book, we market it, they start the next one, and then we work on the next book and then we're marketing all the books. So it's really, really great that way because it, as a membership, it's a long-term relationship, but you can also exit it at any time. That's all. It's always good to know if it's not working out. <laughs> it will, but you know, it's always nice to, to have options available. So, Julie, for for the authors that are interested in working with you, where does their manuscript need to be before they approach book launchers? Uh, I mean, we love to come in as early as possible in the process. So. For us, an idea, um, you know, coming to us with expertise and an idea of what you want your book to do and who you want it to serve, uh, we can help you build a great book from there. Um, anywhere past all the editing, if you come to us with a fully edited book, we will probably say that we won't work with you just because we've learned, we've tried, but we've learned that so many key things have to go into the process early on to set your book up for success. Like I said, you know, title, um, the table of contents, we do a lot of market research in order to position your book early on. So um, I'd say anything before you're through that copy edit, we could probably still help you. <laughs> yeah, well, that's much better because it's like, ah, oh, do you have to be almost done where can you guys come in? So that's really great to know. And again, goes back to, you know, working together from the beginning to ensure you're reaching those goals at the end, which is which is so important. And I had no idea about the table of contents. So that was just a little pro tip that you were able to share with everybody. So that's great. Um, so let's see. Uh, Larry is asking, how do I access your services? So Julie, is this just uh, I know that you spoke about the application process to yeah. work with you. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So um, like I said, booklaunchers.com, there's a self-publishing services tab. So you can see our services there. And then if you're interested, just there's a form right there that just says apply to work with us. You fill that out and it asks a few details just so I can understand. I like to research before I have the call. And right now I'm still doing the calls. We're actually just bringing on somebody to help me with with the calls. But um, we, we're really looking for people who want to grow their brand, build their business, or they have a really powerful story to share with a bigger goal in mind. Those are kind of our nonfiction um, topics and areas and people that we want to work with. And so you fill that out and then we'll hop on the phone. And ultimately, I'm when I'm on the phone, I'm really trying to figure out if we're going to be able to help you succeed. So I want to understand your goals. I want to understand the topic and the audience as much as you do. But if you don't have perfect answers, that's okay, because we've got the story experts, we've got writing coaches, and we've got writers that will help you know draw all that out of you. 
Excellent. Thank you. So Meredith is asking, are there specific services you recommend for a children's book and their nonfiction? Yeah, so I haven't done much with children's books, so I don't have great recommendations there, but um, we do have a video on booklaunchers.tv from a guy named Keith Wheeler Books, who does some really mm -hmm. great work with, with children's books, and he's done, yeah, so he's got great advice, and then I think he actually has some coaching as well. Um, so that mm -hmm. would be one I'd recommend. Yes, Keith is great, and I'll just do a plug. He's working with us on some children's book content as well um, that should be coming out in the next couple weeks. I know, yeah, he's awesome. So if you haven't heard of Keith Wheeler, please check out his channel. Uh, it is amazing. So yeah, I mean, Book Launcher's channel is great. Keith Wheeler's channel is great. A lot of YouTube, a lot of footage out there to uh, to keep up with after this as well. Yeah. So uh, let's see what other questions we have. Okay. So, oh, Bob is asking, book is already published by Lulu. How do you handle the handoff, if you will? So I think this kind of goes back to, you know, you already kind of mentioned where you want to, you know, start working with them in the early stages. But if there is an author that maybe had published their book through Lulu or another form and didn't see the success or the ROI they were hoping to, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, so sometimes it depends on what's going on. And so testing ads can help a lot. And we one of the reasons I use Lulu is to set it up so I can actually test because Lulu gives us the contact information of who buys the book when we set it up through Shopify. Yeah. So so which is phenomenal. And I don't want to go too deep down the ad rabbit hole. But when you run Amazon ads, you find out how many, you know, your ads convert and how, but you don't know who bought your book. And so and you don't get that information. Whereas what we do is we set up our at our book through Lulu, their Lulu Shopify app and sell the book and run Google ads to it. And so and I don't know if you want to go down that, but what that would tell me, excuse me, is if my book is not getting clicks, there's something wrong with my title or my cover. Mm -hmm. And so I would go back. So you have to basically what I'm saying is you have to diagnose why your book isn't selling. And that can be hard to do without information. You'd be guessing. But that's why I say you might want to run some ads to test this. Because if you're not getting clicks, then there's something wrong with the initial like imprint of this. So it could be the metadata, it could be the category, um, but often it's the cover and the title. And the title's hard to change, so that's the tricky part. But the cover can be changed easily. So I would say start with the cover. If that doesn't fix it, then you might have to change the title. Um, but a lot of times the answer actually is you're going to have to relaunch your book. But it depends, and, and that's why I don't know without diving into data and testing and diagnosing. But uh, usually the problems come back to the hook or the lack of reader clarity, and that can translate and come through in the title and the cover. But if you're not really clear on your reader, there's a problem. And, and what I mean by that is, is if you can't identify your reader in terms of their hopes, their dreams, their problems, the things they're listening to, the things they've tried that haven't worked, and this goes even to memoirs, so I would think that that also applies a little bit at least to fiction. Um, oh, it looks like we kind of got cut off. Can you still hear me? I can, yeah. Okay, so I don't have video anymore. <laughs> I don't know where I went. We can still hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so, so yeah, so I think you want to know where your reader is hanging out. And if you can't explain where that reader is and not explain it like, oh, they're everybody or it's all women or it's anybody that's, you know, between the ages of 30 and 50, th that's not knowing your reader. But if you can tell me the books they love, the problems they've tried to solve and how they've tried to solve it, then you probably have reader clarity. So it depends where you fall. And so, yeah, sorry, it's it's a hard question to answer without actually like diving into the specific book and figuring out what the challenge could be. Yeah, and I think one of the things that you talked about that's really important is, you know, definitely we, we say this all the time, but getting a good cover, that's so important. Um, and then, you know, I think to, to Bob's question is if you've already published the book and you're not seeing, you know, the, the return or, the outcome that you were hoping for, I think it's also important to be prepared to let that book go or to kind of chop it up, you know, kill your darlings, if you will. So if, you know, I, I've seen several authors that have published something and, you know, maybe their response was lackluster, but you're so attached to it because you've worked so hard and put it all together. So to kind of take it back to the chopping block or re or see it with new eyes can be difficult. But I think that that should be on the table as well. And you spoke to that really really beautifully. So I would I would recommend to anyone who's published, don't feel like that's your only chance with that, you know, content or that that theme. Okay, so Cassandra is saying um, she has a conversation therapy memoir and can she send you a query letter? So is that how you take things in? I know that there's a form to fill out, but are you are you receiving proposals or query letters or is it just I've got an idea for this book? I would love to get your thoughts on it. 
Yeah, it's just the application process and then a conversation. That's how that's how we go. I don't need to see a book um, in talking to you. I can usually identify the strength of the message and, and I know my team's phenomenal and they can take, if you've got a clear audience and a clear idea and the content for a book, I know my team can make you turn, you know, I, I know my team can help you turn that book into something that will likely achieve your goals. That's the other piece. If you come to us with unrealistic goals, because um, some people have this dream that they're going to sell 10 million copies, which may happen. I'm not going to be your dream killer. However, <laughs> it, it's not something my team has ever done before. So I'm not likely to see, <laughs> not likely to bring you on and say, yes, we can achieve that goal for you. <laughs> But if you say no, there's an opportunity there. That's what we just spent, you know, the first half of exactly. the morning. So if that 10 million is your goal, then, you know, Julie's given us some tools to help you get there. Okay. So Sandy is asking maybe more of a general question that you might be able to speak to, but could you recommend similar services for book launchers for fiction projects or will book launchers ever delve into fiction? I wish, I wish, I wish I had found somebody for fiction because I would have a brilliant referral relationship with them. But I haven't found anybody who does it in the way that I would say this is the company to go to. Um, again, that's where I often de defer to people like self-publishing with Dale and Keith, mm -hmm. Keith Wheeler books and even Lulu. I'm like, there's lots of great resources. Um, ReadZ is one resource uh, that I do use and recommend. So ReadZ.com for just kind of getting the pieces done, but uh, it doesn't have the full service that we do. And I don't see us going into fiction anytime soon because you need genre experts. And as it is in nonfiction, there's memoir, there's self-help, there's business, there's finance. That's enough genre experts. My team's big. <laughs> and if I start diving into YA and mystery and <laughs> all of those other categories, it's, it's a whole to be great at all of those things is difficult. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, at when Lulu started and for a little bit in their earlier, earlier stages, we were trying to be everything to everybody. And I think that that's just the better way to look at it. And even as an author, you know, going back to knowing your audience or creating your book, we speak to authors all the time. And when you say, who's your book for? And you're like, everybody, and you're like, oh, that's so great. You know, you're going to sell so many copies. But if you feel like your book is for everybody, that is kind of a sure sign that you don't know who your audience is and you're not going to be able to connect with them. So I appreciate when, you know, people ask these questions about Lulu and sometimes it can kind of hurt to say, no, we don't do that. But when you know what you're good at, I mean, subject matter experts is so important to be able to work with people who are really good at what they're doing. And so I think yeah. that's a great answer. Uh, let's see. Um, Richard's saying, what about marketing online novels? So Richard, I'm, I'm assuming maybe you're meaning eBooks, um, but we didn't talk about that. So do you offer eBooks and print? And then is it a different marketing plan for eBooks uh, if someone wants to go that route only? Yeah, I mean, yes, absolutely, ebook and print. And again, because we're nonfiction, uh, we actually 65, 70% of the books that people sell, our clients sell, are print. So um, we're, you know, we see a tremendous amount, especially launch. Launch tends to really sell print. And then over time, you'll see a little bit more ebooks being sold. I don't know if that's the same for novels, but for nonfiction, that is certainly a very consistent pattern. But we do have, we, the cool thing about ebooks is you can run sales, right? You can run a 99 cent ebook sale, you can change your price, you can kind of do a variety of things with ebooks that you can't do as easily with print because of the print costs. So yes, we run a lot of, of ebook sales. Um, usually every quarter we run some sort of an ebook sale and promotion with different ebook sites out there. And I know there's actually a lot of great ebook sites um, that do promotions mm -hmm. for novels, but um, I wouldn't be able to dive specifically into those. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. Just to echo that, you know, I think it's so important to put your book in any format that your readers um, enjoy and gravitate to. And, and why not go wide? Make it easy for them to, to digest your book. OK, so Charlene is asking and we you touched on this a bit, but do you take clients that write poetry and children's books? No, we're only nonfiction. And even if it's nonfiction children, we're, we're nonfiction for adults. Again, it's really about building your brand, growing your business. Um, you know, having a bigger impact to that adult audience with with your book. But I'm a big consumer of children's books. I read I read at least two books a, a night. <laughs> yeah, I love seeing your son's cameo. And there he's like, even in that even in that picture that you used, he does, he does not look like someone you're going to be able to say no to. <laughs> he's a tough negotiator. My goodness. <laughs> So Kelly is asking, how do you gauge when a no is mostly from not understanding the book and message versus helpful advice to pivot? It's a great question. Yeah, and that's where I go. I kind of touched on that with Michael Brenner's kind of saying, be careful when you look at a no and you're taking it at face value. So let's go back to the ask why. 
right? Understand this no as much as you can and then take it for what it is or who it's coming from. So a friend is not, and, and friends and family, by the way, um, I have really mixed views of whether you should even listen to them. Uh, and that's not to take away from, I'm sure you have smart friends, I'm sure you have smart family members, but they have their own stuff. And so a really great example is my grandma Broad, who to me was the most positive person in my life. You know, She taught me that if I'm having a bad day, it's my own fault. It doesn't matter what's happened to me, it's my own fault that I'm having a bad day because I have the choice as to how I react to things. Mm -hmm. So that's my grandma Broad. And so you can imagine what it was like when I told my grandma I was moving to Los Angeles from Canada and she told me not to move because everybody does drugs and gets divorced there. Like it was, you know, my always positive grandma. So, but what it was, was her projecting her own fears, her own hopes, her own dreams for me onto me. And it was her own way of doing what she thought she needed to do to, do to keep me safe. So our friends and family have their own stuff that is coming on to you. And so you have to be very careful because it's it's almost impossible for you to know when they're giving you advice and feedback, whether it's real or there's other stuff filtering it because it's almost always filtered. So I always look for third party unbiased advice, like really try to find those people who have the expertise to be giving you this advice and they have no vested interest in the outcome of what you do. So they're really kind of going that way. And that's where I would start is what's this person's interest in what happens to me and 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 ultimately do they have the expertise to be giving me this advice and then go back to your gut right your gut if you can clear the way and listen to your gut your gut's going to tell you because at the end of the day i knew even though wiley told me my book idea wouldn't sell i was like i had read almost every single real estate investing book that was on the market at that time and nobody had talked about mistakes everybody talked about how to get rich Nobody talked about the crack houses they owned, the tenants that pulled knives on other tenants and the tenant and the property managers that robbed rent money, which were all things that happened to me. And I knew I wasn't alone because I was coaching other investors who'd had these problems. So uh, I knew my book needed to be written and I just went back to my gut. So there's a whole bunch of things for you there. <laughs> oh my gosh, I know. I wish that I could unpack that. I wish we had time to go into a little bit more about the crack houses and the stabbings because that's something I... <laughs> Would not have thought I would pull from this webinar, but I love that. I like that he's saving the good stuff till the end. That's like clickbait. We should have titled that Crack Houses and Stabbings with Lulu.com. Okay. So, so, yeah, I think that's the wonderful advice, Grandma Broad. Uh, hilarious. But, yeah, I mean, with family, you know, it, I, I, I think it's so true that, you know, not just with books or business ideas or anything you want to do, like you're saying with a move, you know, take everything with a grain of salt and, and you know, try to get as many opinions as you can. Um, well, I guess to an extent, but definitely having a third party is, is very helpful as well. Um, so Nancy is asking, can you help with a graphic novel or memoir if it's nonfiction? Yeah, graphic novels, no, <laughs> but memoirs, yes. Uh, although again, with memoirs, I, I always wanna go back to the goal. Memoirs are really hard to sell. I'm just gonna be totally straight up with you. They're really hard to sell. Um, they, they often top the charts, but they top the charts because it's a famous person. When you're yeah. not famous, a memoir is tough. So you wanna go back to kind of what's your hook of the book? What's the outcome for the reader when they read it? And a lot of people write a memoir because they think their story is gonna be inspirational. And it, and it would be, but it's hard to sell inspiration. So there has to be a deeper message in that. And if there is, and we think we can help you sell it and we can see audiences for that book, then we absolutely would work with you. But yeah, the, it's not to say don't write your memoir, but it is to say that, you know, prep yourself because if you don't have a very clear message, for a specific type of reader, a memoir is a tough sell. Hmm. All right, and Eben is asking, do you also handle cookbooks? <laughs> no, <laughs> I also I also use a lot of cookbooks. But <laughs> okay, it's good, I can see how that blurs the line. Cookbook is, I guess, nonfiction, so. All right, so Pam is asking, I'm working on a book based on real characters and events set in the American South. Is this considered fiction or nonfiction? Uh, it sounds like it's, you know, it could be fiction based on real life events. Um, it's hard for me to answer that without kind of looking, diving into it. And to be honest, again, I'm a real estate investing expert with an MBA and a BCom. <laughs> I'm not a publisher, uh, a publishing expert uh, in as terms of like literary writing. So that would be something I would turn to my editors and go, what is this? And what category does it belong into? Um, but it sounds like fiction based on true events is kind of what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. Uh, let's see. I see a question that's sort of the same of this one. Uh, Monty's asking, 
uh, found a book of creative humor with wordplay. Is that fiction? I'm going to default and just say um, that, you know, Google it if you're not sure. There's a lot of information online. Um, but, you know, maybe if you go to Book Launchers form and you fill out, they can, they can help you with that. All right, let's see. Someone is trying to Google Keith Wheeler. So uh, Keith, <laughs> Keith, I'll have to tell him that we're plugging him on this uh, on this webinar. <laughs> Um, it's Wheeler, um, W-H-E-E-L-E-R, I think is how, how it's spelled the last name. So, hello, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, had spelled it W-E-I-L-E-R, but it's uh, W-H-E-E-L-E-R, I believe. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, let's see. Oh, we've got Charlene, fellow Canadian, is going to send you her book. That's exciting. Okay, so we are coming to the end of our time, but I will just give everyone a quick second to um, see if, if there are any other questions that are coming top of mind that we can answer quickly. Um, but I, I, I think this is sort of asked, but I do have a question is, you know, Julie, is there ever a time where a no is actually a no? And you should say maybe this project is not, you know, worth investing or continuing to push forward. I think a no, there's always a gift in the no. And sometimes the no does mean turn around and go the other way. Um, mm -hmm. And then, but at the time, that's what it's hard to know in the moment. So you have to listen to your gut and, and go through that step of, you know, why is this a no? Is there another opportunity? Is there another way to achieve this objective? Um, and sometimes it is like head in another direction. And that still ends up being a yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why I'm always excited by no's. I, I do genuinely drive some people crazy because whenever I hear a problem or a no, I'm like, cool, what's this mean? What can we do with it? How can we do something better? <laughs> you know? So, you know, heads up, that can be kind of annoying to be around, but it's, <laughs> but it is ultimately, there's always a gift in every no. And so, yes, maybe it is, it is a no to that project, but it's only a no to that project because you're supposed to go a different way. Yeah. So uh, in the last couple of minutes, I, I was hoping you could leave us with a bit of advice. So with your book about real estate investing, you obviously did a lot of research. So do you have any tips for someone that is sort of starting out on this journey and, you know, wants to write a book, has an idea for it? But how do you go about kind of making sure that you're doing the right market research or you're getting the positioning right? Yeah. And not to end this by plugging my book, but that's really why Please I wrote Self-Published and Succeed. So Self-Published and Succeed, if you're thinking of writing a nonfiction book and head to selfpublishedandsucceed.com, and that's actually my page set up through Lulu. So if you want to see how the Shopify Lulu connection works and get some extra resources, that selfpublishedandsucceed.com will get you to the Lulu page and get my book through Lulu. So you can see all the great stuff Lulu has, off has to offer that way too. Um, but uh, yeah, I wrote that book in order to create the plan so that you are thinking about marketing throughout the entire step and you're hiring the right editors at the right time, you're putting the right marketing elements into your cover, into your title, into your table of contents. So um, ultimately I wrote that book because in all the research I did, nobody really thinks about marketing the book before they start writing it, except for traditional publishers who are mm -hmm. trying to figure out how you're gonna sell the book before you write it. <laughs> Yeah. And th thank you so much for sharing that email. That was, <laughs> I, that was, you know, I was just, how, how could so few words be so disappointing and disheartening? So to say, I mean, you know, I think it's one thing if your, your idea, or your book isn't working, but then, you know, to be called out personally and say, it's, it's not the book, it's you kind of thing. So thank you for, for your openness, your willingness to share that. And I just want to thank again, everyone who tuned in today. Um, and William, uh, if you want to email, well, I, there's some Lulu specific questions in the chat. I'll drop our support email in there after this, but, um, thank you for everyone who's tuned in. Thank you so much, Julie, for being so transparent and open with us and the no's that you've experienced and how they have turned into yeses. Um, again, for anyone who missed, uh, who tuned in late, this recording will be sent out and posted to our YouTube channel as well. Uh, visit booklaunchers.com, visit selfpublishedandsucceed.com, support Julie. Um, anything else, any closing notes you'd like to share? No, uh, thank you so much for having, no, yes. <laughs> This was about yeses. <laughs> uh, make it a great day. I'll just leave it with that. <laughs> well, that sounds amazing. And thank you, everyone, for your patience as we work through some technical difficulties. Thanks, Julie. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. And we'll see you next time. So bye, everybody.